This is The Technical Difficulties. We're playing Citation Needed. Joining me today, he reads books. You know, it's Chris Joel. In space. Everybody's favourite, Gary Brannan. Gary Brannan. Nice to see you. To see you! Nice! Oh. And the bounciest man on the internet, Matt Gray. You planned that? Yeah. <laughs> I planned nothing. <laughs> In front of me, I've got an article from Wikipedia and these folks can't see it. Every fact they get right is a point and a ding. And the special prize for particularly good answers, which is... Oh, yeah. And today we are talking about Juan Pujol Garcia. Juan Pujol, because there are two of them, is he on his own? It's, it's a good job this isn't QI, Gary, because at that point large klaxons <laughs> would be going off with Just that saying job. Repeatedly. <laughs> Can I guess that this person is from a Spanish or Portuguese speaking country? Uh, yeah, uh, Spain. Hey! <laughs> I don't uh, know very much about Spain. It's funny you say that you don't know much about Spain. Did he neither? He didn't know much about England, and that became important during part of his life. <laughs> Did you just end up here? It's like, Shit, what's this? What? Uh, <laughs> I'm going to have a run at this one and miss it, but was he some kind of captain of the Spanish Armada? Oh, no, you're far, far, far too early for that. Was he not the captain of any kind of Spanish <laughs> Armada? Yes, but you're not getting a point for saying he's not something. Was he not the first man to walk on the moon? Is is true. Didn't if he was that... too early for an armada, he's going to be too early for the moon. No, he's too oh. he's too late for an armada. Too late for an armada. Oh, the armada was too early for him. Yes, the armada oh. left, and he, he missed the born. bus. He was centuries. <laughs> did centuries I miss later. the train, or did the train miss me? He cries. <laughs> yeah, he was centuries late for the armada. He was born in 1912, died in 1988. Uh huh. That doesn't help much. It doesn't. Uh, but he had a code name. Did he know? <laughs> given given those dates, why might you want? A code name. Spies. Yes. Is this due in the government of France? Oh, was he a spy placed in England, uh, but he just didn't know anything about the place? So was he a sh spy? <laughs> the, no, the, he was a spy placed in England to look after sheep, and therefore was a shepherd spy. Hey! <laughs> 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 Two people in the audience just going, no, no, there. we're not rewarding that. No, he was he was an excellent spy, but for which side? And we're talking World War II here. Both. Yes. Absolutely right. He was a double agent. Is he involved in the man who never was thing? No, op this was not Operation Mincemeat. Right. This was this Because there was that. someone in that who was sending information both ways, wasn't there? Mm. Uh, this, was, uh, the, this was a man who received both an Iron Cross from Germany and an MBE from Britain. How can that make him a good spy? Surely that makes him a sh spy. Only for one of those sides. Dun, dun, dun. So during the early days of World War II, he decided he had to make uh, a contribution for the good of humanity. And he went to the British, who said... All right. Nah. <laughs> Have a point, Gary. <laughs> Sorry, British. No. <laughs> uh, three different times they turned him down as a spy. So what did he do instead? Oh, did he just go in and start feeding us information without, without us asking him to? That's dreadfully rude of him, but really useful. <laughs> he certainly helped the British without asking, but not by talking to them. Oh, did he Pose. talk... Chris. Daz. Ah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Posed as a British spy and fed false information to the Germans. Spot on. Absolutely right. He uh, he created an identity as a fanatically pro-Nazi Spanish government official who could travel to London on business. And he just started sending false reports to the Germans. Hello, I'm a fucking fanatical Nazi. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Which meant everyone thought he was a spy. But he just wasn't. <laughs> yes, have a point. <laughs> so... The Germans accepted him and said, OK, you're a spy now. They gave him equipment, they gave him a bit of money, and he moved to Lisbon in Portugal. Can you see the coast? Can you see what ships are going round Portugal? <laughs> Look at England from afar. <laughs> <laughs> I'd go over there to spy directly, but the weather, <laughs> really? His instructions were move to Britain and recruit a network of British agents. So did he pretend he was in Britain when he was actually in Portugal? Yes. Oh. <laughs> Clever He's a bastard. really good spy. Hmm. He's such a good spy that he isn't a spy and everyone thought he was a spy. <laughs> and then he told them that he was spying and he wasn't doing the spying. How is he actually sending reports in? Because he is sending reports in. Is he sending them to London who are then directed via London or something so they're coming from the right route? He's just uh, throwing them over the wall and running away. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's staying in Lisbon for this. Pretending? Uh, yes. Did he just lie? Yes. <laughs> What might he have used as the basis for that? 
Because remember, he's just sitting in Lisbon, sending radio? completely false reports about Britain. Was he listening to British radio? Um, newsreel reports in cinemas. But yeah, he's, he's yeah. looking at the news uh, and using a tourist's guide to Britain. Which, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, the Nazis could watch the news as well. <laughs> yes, but they still believed him. Because they saw it on the news, they thought that what he was saying was correct because he'd seen it on the news. <laughs> He was confirming the British propaganda, but by, by, <laughs> but he was. He, if he's dressed up as a spy saying, yes, I know these things, and then the news says those things because he's already seen the yeah. news, then they think he's... He's right. Yes, you're, you're absolutely right. That's pretty much what happened. <laughs> there was one slight problem, and he's putting expense reports in, by the way, here. He's getting oh, reimbursed he's for he's living this. the dream now. Now I'm with him. What's the slight problem with his expense reports? Oh, was Portuguese currency decimal, so he couldn't forge the receipts? Yes, Yeah, it because was. it's really hard to convert decimal to uh, an imperial currency system because it's, com it's pegged completely differently. Yeah, more than that, he didn't know how pounds, shillings and pence worked. <laughs> Because <laughs> he'd never been there. Yes, so he's making mistakes, but the reports are still credible. So credible that what happens? Do we spend a lot of time trying to find him and couldn't oh, because yes. he's yes. in Lisbon? Man, I'm in London. <laughs> <laughs> MI5 launched a full-scale spy hunt after they intercepted uh, his reports. How can they intercept his reports when they're coming from Portugal? Because he's probably radioing them or Morse coding them across and they'll be cracking that, won't they? Yeah, through the Ultra program. Yes, you're absolutely right. <laughs> so they did uh, eventually move him to Britain. Uh, and they gave him a code name. Was it a bit of a shock for him to actually move to Britain? Uh, he was given uh, a code name for uh, a very British drink. Creme de Month. <laughs> <laughs> Tea. Bovril. Oh! oh! <laughs> and he's no idea. To go What's your code name? Agent Bovril. Midnight. What's yours? Bovril. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they did change his code name later to Marmite. Marmite. <laughs> Uh, Codename Garbo. Nice. From, so from Bovril to Garbo. Yes. Garbage. Autobiography there for everybody. <laughs> so what was he actually sending? We've got a mixture of three things here. Complete fiction. What's the other two categories? Newspaper clippings. Football scores. Genuine information of little military value. But you know what? Football scores is fine. I'll give you a point. <laughs> was he sending stuff that... Well, well okay. For one of a phrase, was he leaving them breadcrumbs of things he thought might be happening soon so they would keep drip-feeding drip very small amounts in to keep them on the hook? Ooh, you're, you're close. But there is one thing that they did. He, the first bit of this is valuable military intelligence. He did actually send proper intelligence to the Germans. There's just one catch with it. It was armless or it was out of date or late? Uh, yes. Artificially delayed. Ah. So he sent perfectly accurate data. It was postmarked in time. So, and they're going to say, if we'd only read this quicker, this would have, we'd have intercept this because we read this about three days later than we could have. <clears throat> and if only we had more staff reading this stuff, we would have got there quicker. So they employed more staff, yeah? I quote, We are sorry they arrived too late, but your last reports were magnificent. <laughs> <laughs> the Germans wanted quicker reports and better encryption. They didn't so, get that. <laughs> well, they did. What did they send him? An Enigma machine. Yes. No! <laughs> no! <laughs> you! <laughs> it's not an Enigma machine, but it's, oh, it's the strongest, book. strongest code book that the Germans have. It was hell. promptly sent to him. He must have thought it was bleeding Christmas when that <laughs> straight down Bletch on his bike. Got one. <laughs> what was Operation Fortitude in 1944? A good arty breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> Did it come after Operation 39-itude? <laughs> no. <laughs> but it came immediately before another famous operation. 41-itude! <laughs> I set that one up, didn't I? <laughs> Overlord. Yes, which was... Uh, D-Day. Yes. So immediately before Operation Overlord, which was the D-Day landings, Operation Fortitude was designed to do what? This isn't the thing with the inflatable tanks, is it? Yes, it is. What? And in fact... <laughs> they, they, they made some tank-shaped balloons. Balloon-shaped tanks? <laughs> tank-shaped balloons. Do you like the first oh, I've time? I've heard of this before. Yeah, and they, they, position, they, they positioned them strategically in exactly the place the Germans thought they would be positioned. And for some reason, I've never quite worked out, that was enough. Despite the fact I'm almost certain one of them will probably got end up filled with helium and might have floated <laughs> upwards. I like the idea that they're not pumped up enough and just got really limp guns. <laughs> 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 so they accept he's going to send some genuine information, and he's got the German uh, he's got the German radio operators listening in all night, 
and he sends them at 3 a.m. some reasonable, maybe slightly too late details of a bit of what's going on. There's an invasion happening, you know. What happened? The Germans were asleep. Yes. <laughs> oh. Well, we don't know if they were asleep. They just didn't send a reply until 8 a.m. Sorry, was asleep, had phone on silent. That yes. <laughs> so what does he do? Because it's now definitely too late. Sends an incensed message that they aren't listening to him. Yes. Yeah, I is... cannot accept excuses or negligence. <laughs> <laughs> oh. He's bollocking them. And Love then it. sends pretty much the accurate details of the invasion, which is happening right now, and they can't do anything about because they were too late. Oh. <laughs> that, oh. That gives him a free pass. Yeah. Yes, it does. Because he's like, I would have told you had you been awake at 3 a.m. The Germans paid Garbo how much? Over the network of agents, over 27 fabricated people over years. I've got a number here in US dollars that Germans sent straight to MI5. Am I allowed to get in Reich marks? No. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to do prices right rules here, as usual. Closest without going out. US, US dollars. US dollars, 1944. One million. I'm going to say it's about $10.92 because they never actually paid him because he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Clever. I was going to go for about 600,000. Uh, Matt is closest without going over. 340,000 US dollars Ooh. went straight from the German treasury to the British one. The might as well have just like, sent a plane over and just bombed us with banknotes, mightn't they? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he was presented uh, with some awards for this. Best spy, and also, controversially, worst spy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a German military award. You said the Iron Cross. Yeah, I was hoping you'd forgotten that. That must uh, have been awkward turning up for you, because he said he got a George Cross or something, didn't you? MBA, he's still wearing MBA. the MBA. With the Iron Cross. <laughs> yeah, a got... suspiciously Iron Cross-shaped mark on where his breast pocket was. Well, Did he turn up in Germany to receive awards? No, it was awarded by radio. Uh, and then he received the physical medal from one of his German handlers after the war had ended. But if he didn't like the institution, and he had all of these awards from two different institutions, surely he f***ing hated that? Yes. But why did he have to accept it anyway? Because otherwise it would blow his cover and he'd get killed by some mysterious agents they probably thought still existed at the time. Yes, he feared reprisals after the war. Because we all assume, like, neatly the war ended in 45. They weren't very sure the war was actually over for quite a long time because they kind of thought, they'll be back, like they are in films. That there's like a secret cachet of Nazis that we're gonna after pop the up. credits. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a single Nazi helmet pops up out of the ground. Yeah. Dun, 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 dun. Well, you know, seventy years later they're back. Anyway, um. <laughs> <laughs> so what did he do? Moved he is... to America and lived a quiet life. Uh, you know, what? I'll give you that. He he went to Angola. That's not America. <laughs> and then went to Venezuela, like the so Nazis if you say, did. So if you say America, Venezuela is. Sort of, it's South America. South America. I'll, I'll give you the point. It's an America. He also did something else. Faked his own death. Yes, he did. He faked his own death from malaria in 1949 and then changed his identity, moved to Venezuela and lived doing what? Hard drugs. Printing expense forms. <laughs> Money laundering. A, a, a bookshop. Ah. A bookshop and gift shop. The books are full of spies. <laughs> 1971, British politician Rupert Allison uh, is trying to track down... Garbo. Is this for his MBE? Uh, no, he's, he's got he's the MBE. Got um, but no one knows his real name. Does everyone just know him as Bovril Garbo? Yes, <laughs> essentially. I like the name as a full name, Bovril Garbo. That's a great name. <laughs> Eventually, Alison tracks down someone who supplied his full name and knew roughly where he was. So what does Alison then do? Is, 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 is he gone through every Juan Garcia in Venezuela, but there are loads of them? You know what, that's close enough, I'm going to give you the point. He went through every J. Garcia in the Barcelona phone book. <laughs> <laughs> and eventually got in touch with his nephew. In Barcelona? In Barcelona. That's not Venezuela? No, because no one knew where he'd gone. Of course, yeah, we know that later. So, yeah, hello, was your uh, was anyone you know a spy? Yes, that's basically what happened. And this person said yes, and they believed him. That's exactly the thing a spy wouldn't do. <laughs> <laughs> now, you make an excellent point there. I was going to say that uh, Pujol travelled to London... Uh, and it says here, and was received by Prince Philip at Buckingham Palace. But now you've said that, no, who knows sure. who it was? Because <laughs> Prince Philip never met him. Or you say that he then went to the Special Forces Club and was reunited with a group of his former colleagues. Who told him he'd had plastic surgery while he was in Venezuela, <laughs> and so looked and sounded different because was... Oh, what? Bovril, up to your old tricks. Yeah, oh, Bovril. <laughs> you yeah. do know that plastic surgery doesn't work like it does in the Bond movies, right? Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they called every single Jay Garcia in the Barcelona phone book. They found his nephew. His nephew put the politician in touch with 
the original spy, and he came over and, and met Prince Philip, uh, toured the beaches of Normandy, uh, and eventually died in Caracas in 1988, and is essentially the greatest spy that Britain nearly didn't have. <laughs> <laughs> and when he came over, he brought a big stack of expense forms for him for all his staff back <laughs> in the office. So at the end of the show, congratulations, Chris, you win this one. Uh, you win uh, a trip to an all-you-can-eat garlic restaurant. All-you-can-eat? Buffet the Vampire Slayer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> With that, we say thank you to Chris Joel, to Gary Brennan, to Matt Gray. I've been Tom Scott. We'll see you next time.